the invasion in the refugee camps of Sabra and Shatila, Israel's allies slaughtered hundreds of Palestinians while the Israelis watched. My colleague Hanadi was out of Lebanon at the time, but for anyone who was there, the memories are as fresh as if the killings happened yesterday. And then as I walked up here, the first thing I saw were horses, dead horses, behind, around where that white building is. And I thought to myself, why would anyone kill a horse? And we hadn't, still hadn't seen anyone dead. And as we got just up here, just a, maybe 20 yards more, we saw two women lying on the ground on their backs with their clothes torn, middle-aged women. And sort of things scattered around them. I don't know, I thought they were maybe teapots. Maybe they were brewing tea when the gunman came and shot them. And just beyond them, behind their heads, lying on the ground, was a, was a baby that was dead with a bullet in its head. It was a while when we were in here, it was quite a while before we realized that the Christian gunmen whom the Israelis had sent in were, were still in the camp. We heard shooting. So we all got very frightened. And at one point, my two colleagues, Carsten and Lauren, they were somewhere over there. And I could, I could hear them talking, but I didn't know where they were. And I was shouting, Carsten, Lauren! And you could still hear this shooting. And there was a kind of earth embankment, just like this one. The place has changed so much, new, new buildings, but there was an earth embankment like this. And I tried to climb over it, and I got on top. And when I was on it, it became all kind of spongy, and it, it moved up and down. And I realized it wasn't an earth embankment. It just had a covering of earth. And when I looked down, I saw a face, an elbow. They were all bodies, and it was somebody's stomach. And I just literally held my breath and jumped off the other side and went running down that, that road down there, because that's where I could hear my friends' voices. I was so, so frightened at the time. There were bodies scattered all over here, civilians, all of them. We never saw a gun, never saw a gun next to anybody here. And the big question we were asking ourselves when we came in here was answered when we stood here and looked up there. Because we were asking all the time, did the Israelis know what was going on? And I'd been in the camp maybe two hours before I got to this point, and I looked up at that building, and I saw the flash, the sunlight catching binoculars, the flash on the glass. And when I looked at it carefully, I saw Israeli soldiers on the top. And they were obviously looking at me, so they could see the bodies, so they knew what was happening. I watched the American Marines arrive to protect the Palestinians, but Washington decided to support the Israeli-sponsored Lebanese government. American firepower was then directed at Muslim militias. The Muslims were bound to take their revenge. What happened next was to be a trauma in modern American history. Early on the morning of October the 23rd, 1983, a Muslim drove a truck bomb loaded with two tons of explosives into the US Marine base. The largest bomb since Hiroshima killed 241 Americans. The Americans regarded the suicide bombing as an act of mindless terrorism. The Muslim fundamentalists saw it as their greatest victory against Israel's closest ally. The most powerful army in the world had been struck down by a country without an army. were they, these young Americans? Innocent, naive, brave no doubt, inevitably doomed, 
recording their tragic role in history without realizing their fate. The Americans had firepower. The Muslims who bombed them claimed they had God on their side. Technology versus God, an equation that was to have ferocious results in Lebanon. Man was wearing green fatigues and driving a yellow truck. And he says, as the man went by, he says he always remembered that the guy was smiling. He says he always remembered that the guy was smiling. And he says he always remembered that the guy was smiling. A frightening new weapon had been introduced into the Middle East conflict. The car bomber, as dedicated as any kamikaze pilot, even allowing his comrades to film his own immolation. First time we had a suicide bomber actually have his own death filmed. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, Mohammed Hatib. A man whose his home taken away from us, him. <coughs> Many of us hoped that our film would save his home. It did not. He was forced off his land by the Israelis before Christmas of 1993, forced to go and live in, with relatives in that small town you saw with the minaret, which Mickey Mollo pointed out, called Hizmi. I've been back several times to the land. Today, I was there last year actually, but this day now, you cannot tell it was ever unplanted land or uh, planted land with a farm. It is total concrete from one end to the other. You can never tell that a Palestinian has ever lived there. And remember that film was subtitled, How Muslims Come to Hate the West. We did many other things in the film. It cost a million dollars in all. It was made on real film. We followed not just a Palestinian's home in Israel, what is Israel now, what was Palestine, which had been taken over by a Jewish family in 48. We went to the Jewish family's home in Poland, where they had been driven from their home by the Nazis. Shortly after this series aired on Discovery here in the States, however, a series of pro-Israeli lobby groups, including Camera, the Camera Media Resources Center, bombarded the channel with complaints. Joseph Ungar wrote to complain that for me to say that Israel confiscates or occupies land and builds huge Jewish settlements on Arab land was twisted history. Twisted history. To say that the Phalangist militia had been sent into Sabra and Shatila by Israel was an egregious falsehood. One letter said it, that Fisk was Henry Higgins with fangs. Those of you who like My Fair Lady will know the reference. I was drooling venom into the living rooms of America. These claims, of course, were totally false, but discovery rang me in Beirut to say they were receiving even more letters condemning the films from lobby groups. Then director Mike Dutfield and I heard that discovery had cancelled the second showing of this series on, on, in America. Duck, uh, Bunting, the deputy senior vice president of Discovery, then wrote a letter when Duckfield asked him if it was true. And I will quote to you what he said. Please don't laugh till the end. He denied, you see, there was any cancellation. Given the reaction to the series upon its initial airing, we never scheduled a subsequent airing. So, th so there's not really an issue as to any scheduled re-airing being cancelled. When I read those words, ladies and gentlemen, I felt ashamed to be a foreign correspondent. Interestingly, the condemnation and abuse that I regularly receive, far outnumbered, I should add, by literally many thousands of emails praising the independence coverage of the Middle East from Jerusalem as well as Beirut, the condemnation has increased significantly since The Independent became available through its website, www.independent.co.uk, to Internet users throughout the world, especially America. Many American readers have lamented to us what one of them called our lobotomized journalistic coverage. A number of letters of support, I, have, I must say, also came from Jewish Americans. But the mailbag contained the usual vitriol. An American law student at a British university wrote to tell me that I was an evil fucking man. A remark he withdrew when I called him at his college and threatened to bring the police round for threatening behavior. He'd been foolish enough to put his phone number on the email. <laughs> Another letter, anonymous this time, began, 
To Mr. Shit Fisk, you are what you are, an 